Good afternoon and welcome to today's program titled The Neuropsychological Basis of Experiential Therapies. I'm Tom Valentino, Senior Editor for the Institute for the Advancement of Behavioral Healthcare. Today's program is sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network. Thank you to our sponsors and to our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, we have a few details we'd like to go over. To submit a question for our presenter, please use the Q&A area below the slides at any time. You do not have to wait until the end of the program to ask a question. If you're having technical issues, please click the Test Your Connection button below the video window to chat with support. And finally, to download a copy of the presentation, please click the link in the Resources tab to the right of your slides. Special note about CE credit, to get your CE, you must watch the program all the way through the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. At the end, do not leave the web page. The site will automatically redirect you to a survey. And this must be completed in order to generate your CE certificate. For those watching in a group, please download the group submission guide in the resources tab and follow the instructions provided. Please note CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for the live event on July 31st, 2018. Finally, for those of you who tweet, please tweet along with us using the hashtag IABHC live webinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Matthew Tatum. He is the Executive Director at First Steps Recovery. Dr. Tatum has a proven history of developing the highest quality clinical programming with foundations in integrated behavioral health, and more recently in drug and alcohol treatment. His incorporation of mental health therapies, neuropsychological research, experience-based therapies, and traditional drug and alcohol treatment provide a holistic approach that propels patients' recovery process in the direction of healing. Thank you, Dr. Tatum, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you, Tom. Um, so today we want to talk a little bit about the neuropsychological underpinnings of addiction. Um, we're going to dive into the neuropsychological benefits of using experiential and holistic therapies in addiction treatment centers. And we're going to talk a little bit about ways to um, communicate the neuropsychological underpinnings and the benefit of using those types of therapies to uh, payers and to people in the community so that we can more effectively inform those of the work that we're doing that has a scientific basis and, and works. Um, so we first want to start with an understanding of the neuropsychological principles that underlie addiction. And for some of you, this might be review. Um, and so we'll go through this. Um, and feel free to ask more in-depth questions as, as we move along. Um, so some of the psychological mechanisms that are involved in the neuropsychology of addiction, you know, as, as humans, we are, in a sense, hardwired to avoid suffering. We seek pleasure, and we try to avoid things that cause any discomfort or pain, but we know that that is not entirely possible to avoid pain in the human condition. Um, and so our response to our relationship with our pain has a big influence on whether or not we experience suffering in our lives or we sit with and tolerate and learn from our painful experiences. So oftentimes when being confronted with an experience of pain, whether that's not getting a need or a want to gratified or some sort of physical encounter with hurt, um, we seek to, to change that experience. And, and in doing so, we often look to some sort of external stimuli in order to bring us back to that, that sense of okayness. Um, and, and that external stimuli can be any number of things. It can be a piece of chocolate cake. It can be a conversation with a loved one. Uh, for the clientele that we often serve, it, it tends to be drugs or alcohol. And that discomfort, again, can be anything. It can be stress, it can be boredom, it can be not feeling like life is enough, it can be any number of those things. So when we seek to alter our sense of discomfort or sense of pain that we experience day to day in life, 
uh, our brain is very attuned to those things that we seek out to provide that sense of comfort or that sense of pleasure or the reduction of distress. And our brain is very aware of what works and what doesn't work. And we'll kind of get into the neuro underpinnings of that. But just know that cognitively, our brain is uh, hypersensitive to what is it that is causing the improvement in functioning or the improvement of mood, uh, the, the sense of dealing with that pain effectively. And so we learn in those situations uh, what is bringing us stress relief or what is bringing us pleasure. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about tolerance and compulsion in the, the next section that has to do with the neurobiological mechanisms. But um, as we look at the neurobiological mechanisms that underlie addiction, we know that addiction exerts a long and powerful influence on the brain and that it manifests itself in three distinct ways that we're all very familiar with. Um, the addiction, there's the craving for the object of addiction, and then there's a sense of loss of control over its use, and then there's a continued involvement with the substance despite its adverse consequences. So again, the ways that addiction exerts power on the brain is craving, loss of control, and continued involvement. So when we start to look at how that plays out in the reward circuitry of the brain, again, I assume that most listeners are pretty familiar with the re reward circuitry as it applies to addiction, but we'll go over it briefly here. Um, in the brain, pleasure, as we talked about earlier, um, has a distinct signature in the brain. It releases the neurotransmitter dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which is a cluster of nerve cells in the cerebral cortex. Um, dopamine that's released in the nucleus accumbens is consistently tied to the pleasure, um, and that's why we call that the pleasure center of the brain. So we know that addictive drugs have a very powerful influence on the pleasure center of the brain, that addictive drugs can release any more any amount, uh, two to 10 times the amount of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens than any natural type of experience, a conversation with a loved one, a trip to the gym, um, watching your son graduate from college, any of those kinds of things. Drugs act two to, time, two to 10 times more powerfully in the nucleus accumbens. And so when we start to look at the nucleus accumbens as the pleasure center of the brain and, and the surrounding neurocircuitry or neuro, neuro, neurological regions of the brain that form the um, the reward system, we then start to look at some of the neighbors of the nucleus accumbens. Um, so when the nucleus accumbens is getting this big flood of dopamine when somebody is using, um, some of the surrounding areas that are affected are things like the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory. And so when there's a big flood of dopamine into the nucleus accumbens, the hippocampus, becomes very aware of that and it stores memories of the rapid release of dopamine and the, the sense of pleasure and satisfaction that the nucleus, nucleus, nucleus accumbens experiences. And then the, the other center right around the corner, the amygdala, uh, that we all know is sort of the emotion center of the brain, creates a conditioned response in uh, the experience that sort of closes the loop. So, we have the three of those clusters working together that create the reward pathways that are mostly involved in the addictive process. So as we understand um, neuropsychology, we know that um, neurons that fire together wire together, right? So what that means is that um, when neurons or neural pathways that are next to each other they have a relationship or a bond, and when they're used repeatedly, the brain likes to be very efficient. And so it strengthens or re reinforces those pathways so that the brain can use them more effectively or more efficiently the next time that it encounters that same situation. And so with the reward pathways, when those get used over and over again, um, the brain becomes very effective at providing that pleasure principle in response to the use of, of the drugs or the alcohol or whatever the addictive component is. 
And so what happens as we understand an addiction is that tolerance then begins to build because uh, people are continuing to introduce the same stimuli, or in this instance, uh, the drugs or the alcohol into their system. And the body naturally has a way of becoming accustomed to those uh, substances and to the chemicals that they're produced in the brain. And the brain begins to eliminate some of the dopamine receptors in that reward circuitry and produce less dopamine in response to the same amount of substances that are introduced into the body which means that the individual has to introduce more substances in order to have the same effect. And so um, as the brain becomes adaptive to the substances, it's almost like the brain is turning down the volume on a loudspeaker because the noise is too loud. Um, so what we see is that uh, the effectiveness or the efficiencies of these neural pathways get strengthened every time somebody uses and as the volume gets turned down as the brain tries to respond to the flood of dopamine to reduce the receptors and reduce the produ production of dopamine these pathways get strengthened so a lot of times with patients i like to use the analogy of of a road and a road that often might start as a dirt road and it's not a very effective way to travel to get from point a to point b but it'll do the job, right? And that's sort of the early phases of addiction that maybe we just call use. Somebody is using a substance. They're driving down a dirt pathway, gets them from point A to point B, uh, but not very quickly, effectively, efficiently. And so the person um, continues to drive down that dirt road and they decide, well, it would be much more efficient. The brain decides it will be more efficient if we reinforce this road or this pathway. And so we, maybe you put down gravel and asphalt and in this analogy, the brain then uh, adds more um, bundles or more connections to this pathway, to the neural pathways. And so as, as time goes by and the person uses more and more, that gravel becomes asphalt, becomes a two-lane street, becomes a highway eventually. And that's when we really start to look at addiction is, is it's created this highway that is very efficient method of, of travel uh, that you can go at high speed uh, from point A to point B very quickly um, and it's very efficient. In the same way the brain creates these efficiencies and, and the reward pathways um, in order to, to be more effective. Um, so one of the ways that that this happens is um, through the use of, of dopamine. So we all know that dopamine plays a very significant role in um, addiction in the brain and in this, the nucleus accumbens, as we had talked about. Um, so I want to kind of talk a little bit about the dopamine threshold and what that looks like in the brain as this highway is being developed. Um, so the dopamine threshold is a, a concept um, that everybody has sort of a certain level of homeostasis, a certain level of normalcy with um, dopamine levels in the brain. And so the analogy that I use with this one with patients a lot of times is that of a bucket. That We all have a, a level in our bucket that feels normal. It feels okay. We feel content. We feel um, at ease. And then... You know, on any given day, for all of us, again, going back to our experience of pain that's inevitable in this life, we experience a fluctuation in the levels in our bucket, in our dopamine. So we experience um, something maybe negative in our environment. We get a critique from our employer, and we experience a little drop in our bucket. Our dopamine goes down. And so constantly, day to day in life, we're looking at fluctuating dopamine levels, and sometimes we modulate those with food, sometimes with exercise, other times with um, communication with those that are around us, or connection, um, and and other times we we choose unhealthy ways of coping to bring our dopamine level back to to that homeostatic state that feels normal and and good to us. Um, so the, the method or the way that we go about restoring our dopamine to its threshold that feels normal is really, really important because there are methods of restoring um, that homeostasis that are 
productive from a long-term standpoint and those that are detrimental from a long-term standpoint, both psychologically and neuro neurologically. There are ways of restoring dopamine that lead to rapid increases, um, like um, chocolate or sugary foods or um, drugs and alcohol. And there are methods of improving our dopamine um, that are long-term sustainable methods like attachment and exercise. So we'll look a little bit more at that later when we start talking about experiential and holistic versions of therapy that support healthy brain functioning during the recovery process. Um, but, but again, going back to the bucket analogy, one of the ways that I kind of liken that um, with patients is that um, the maladaptive ways of restoring uh, your dopamine levels to that, that threshold the maladaptive ways are like poking holes in the bucket. They lead to a drop in deep dopamine after that experience, that sensation, the encounter with the stimuli, or after the dopamine is is released. And so you go from a point of uh, experiencing pain and saying, I want to get back to my dopamine threshold. And so you use drugs and you get this big spike in dopamine and you go above your threshold and you get the experience of euphoria and it works, right? That's an effective coping skill to get your brain to where it wants to be. The problem is that it experiences a crash in dopamine afterwards that is harder for the brain to recover than if you were to use a positive coping skill. And so when you're punching a hole in the bucket, you're not allowing the brain to recover as quickly uh, when you're using substances as if you were using a more natural and more healthy coping skill. So as we move on, look at the next slide on experiential and holistic therapies. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about each one of those um, so that we are on the same page and have a, a similar understanding of what those therapies are and look like. So experiential therapy isn't one particular type of psychotherapy. Experiential therapy is more of a cluster, a grouping, a shared, um, a shared concept among a variety of interventions and types of therapy. Um, the one thing that experiential therapies have in common is the use of experience or action as the therapeutic intervention or as the change agent um, when working with somebody. They also share in common the, the desire to bring awareness, to work through and process, to teach new skills. Um, and some of the goals of experiential therapy are to elicit thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that traditional talk therapy cannot. Because we all know in our experience that there are certain things that, uh, even certain regions of the brain that we can't access with our patients through traditional talk therapy. But through experience, through action, we can elicit other behavioral patterns, other thoughts, other emotions that we might not be able to with traditional talk methods. And so in um, experiential therapy, after we're evoking those thoughts and feelings and behaviors, um, we have the opportunity to, to look at those and to work through them. And really the goal is to be able to identify what they are, to label them, to process or work through them, and then gain a better understanding of them. So again, we, we try to identify them and the therapist is involved in making an observation. You can see behavioral component or um, you can see the emotion in the patient. You help them slow down to understand it, to label it as sadness or anger or boredom. Um, then you help them to understand what is that emotion teaching them about themselves or their needs or their environment. So what this does the the experiential uh, application of, of therapy or the action orientation is really to provide more neuropsychological integration because we're doing more than just evoking um, the verbal regions of the brain and so we're really looking at a, a more holistic brain-based uh, integrative approach to doing treatment um, and we're going to look at types of experiential therapy, as we mentioned, this is a broad sort of category, not a 
specific type of therapy, the specific types that some people are familiar with are things like adventure therapy, which can incorporate hiking and recreational activities, sports and leisure, and games. Um, a lot of people are very familiar with equine-assisted therapy and animal-assisted therapies, which are all versions of experiential therapies. Um, modalities that aren't as prevalent now that, that were uh, a few decades ago tend to be gestalt therapy and psychodrama, um, where some of the experiential psychotherapies got their early foundation. Um, and we can also see ways in which art and music therapy um, and expressive therapies fall within this experiential therapy category. So a lot of times when we're looking at the use of experiential therapy and, and understanding how it's best used, um, then we talked a little bit about the increase in insight and personal understanding um, that comes with using this modality. But we also can see that it can be used very effectively in practice, practicing new skills and experimenting with new roles that you might not be able to in the traditional talk therapy setting. So when you look at the benefits of experiential therapy, um, we can see that the patients tend to be less defensive when using this therapeutic modality, that especially when we're, when we're talking about treatment in the addiction arena, um, the, the folks that we tend to encounter tend to be very experience driven. They tend to be very action oriented. And so getting them out of their chair and getting them involved in acti action or activity or an exercise really allows the defensiveness to come down and allows us to have a more authentic encounter with people and see some of the nuances of the things that they might struggle with that they might not otherwise be able to to verbalize to us. Because we know that at times our patients also have a difficulty with insight and awareness. And so they're not able to identify on their own what some of the issues are. And so in a therapeutic encounter in an experiential setting, we are able to identify those with them and for them because we're able to see the maladaptive thought patterns and behaviors that, that are a natural part of their struggles. And we can help identify those and bring their awareness to them so that there can be change. Um, this version of therapy is also helpful for people um, that have difficulty verbalizing their thoughts and feelings um, because it allows a different mode of a brain functioning um, to elicit those thoughts and feelings so that it's easier for them to be able to process without just doing the verbal um, conversations that traditional talk therapy are restricted to. So some of the examples of ways that we incorporate experiential-based therapies at First Steps Recovery are um, a strong inclination to use nature-based outings, um, knowing that the, the connection with nature has a strong neuroscientific background um, and is strongly supported um, in helping improve dopamine levels. So we use that as, as one of the experiential components um, in our programming um, to do therapies that, that are more recreational in nature, um, but we bring a process orientation to to that in order to facilitate more learning um, and and trying on new skills that that otherwise they might not be able to encounter um, in a regular group setting. So as we move on to kind of talking about holistic therapies, again talking about the types, uses, and benefits of of holistic therapies. Um, just in clarifying kind of what this means, I think that this term has taken on um, a unique meaning in popular culture. And and so when using it in a, in a scientific way, I think it's important to be pretty clear on what we're talking about when we say holistic. So that it's not just a catch-all for anything that we want to use in a therapeutic setting um, and that seems flashy or that seems um, like it draws a lot of attention. And so um, holistic therapy really is, is a philosophical underpinning that orients us um, to the multiple facets of a patient's experience. And so this orientation really is, is to allow us to see the person as a whole, which includes oftentimes the, the perspective of mind, body, and spirit, so that we're not just limited in, in our setting to focusing on the mind there 
thoughts and their feelings and their past experiences, but that we're really looking at all of the person and addressing the multiple areas that, that we might need to, because um, addiction encompasses obviously all facets of, of human existence. Um, so this orientation is also very non-specific in that it can incorporate a variety of interventions and isn't limited to any one um, set of interventions from one particular discipline. Um, so things uh, that are considered holistic within the addiction field can be things like massage therapy, nutrition counseling, acupuncture, exercise programs, uh, religious and spiritual exercises or religious and spiritual leaders and practitioners within um, that space, the use of vitamins and supplements, and so on and so forth. Um, and the uses of holistic therapies are, are very broad. Um, there's a wide range of presenting issues that they can be beneficial for in a lot of ways that they can be applied to a, a specific person's needs and treatment. Um, so incorporating um, holistic therapies into addiction treatment can be really beneficial. And we know that um, our patients come to us and have been ingesting uh, potentially toxic chemicals for months or even years. And we know that those chemicals aren't just uh, used by the body and the brain and then excreted. We know that those are stored uh, in the cells in the body for uh, long periods of time, even after the use stops. And so there are things that we can do from a holistic perspective to address those types of things, to help the body and the brain um, restore healthy functioning more quickly. Um, and and they, they can be very practical and, and tangible things that we can do to facilitate that process. Um, and so incorporating those holistic therapies allow us to address the toxins that are trapped in the body and in the brain in order to restore the healthy functioning and balance that people need to give them success and long-term recovery. So some examples of ways that we do that at First Steps um, is that we have a daily exercise program so our patients attend the gym each day. Um, and from a holistic perspective, this does a couple of things. It restores healthy dopamine functioning as we were talking about that analogy with the bucket. Um, that is a healthy, sustainable way of restoring dopamine functioning. It's actually one of the the ones that has the most neuroscientific grounding in all the literature um, is regular daily exercise. We also know that it can help flush some of the toxins that are stored in, in fat cells. Um, from the holistic perspective, we know that it builds healthy coping skills for dealing with those fluctuations in dopamine levels. Um, and can be a positive outlet for people in their recovery. Um, another example of something that we do at First Steps that, that is holistic in nature with a neuroscientific background is, um, is our nutrition. And so we have a cook that uh, designs meals intentionally for our patients um, so that we know that, that the things that they are taking in are things that are benefiting their body and their brain to support healthy functioning in the recovery process. Um, the other thing that we do just from a programmatic standpoint is, is um, not allow access to excessive sugar, things like ice cream and soda and candy, because we know that especially early in recovery, patients are looking for uh, that spike in dopamine, especially after they finish something like a detox, um, they, they get that, those increased cravings and we see uh, people leaving treatment against clinical advice because they they have that strong urge and that strong craving and, and in the treatment setting they might look for a gallon of ice cream or um, a bag of chips and candy or a six pack of soda and so um, they're looking for that same kind of fix but that's going to give them the same spike and drop in dopamine levels and so we want to support um, their uh, they're functioning in a more positive, more healthy way. So we we move into that area with them and and help them develop the coping skills and work through those moments without having to turn to another um, unhealthy way of of getting a spike in their dopamine levels. Um, so if we look at the next slide, um, 
and we start to talk about um, neuroplasticity and brain change through the use of experiential and holistic therapies, this really is where we start to look at, okay, if we understand the neuropsychology of addiction and we uh, are using these uh, therapeutic techniques that are holistic and experiential in nature, and we have the anecdotal evidence that they work, how can we neurologically know that they are effective with our patients. So what we want to look at is the way that the brain changes itself in response to these interventions so that we know that the things that we're doing in, in the treatment space are working. Um, so when we start to talk about neuroplasticity, um, we're really looking at the ways in which the brain is malleable or adaptive. Um, and, and from a physiological standpoint, so the structures and the neurochemistry in the brain can change in response to experience in the same way that they can change in response to the introduction of drugs or alcohol. So we talked earlier about the way that the brain structures um, get reinforced and change, like turning a dirt road into a highway. Um, in response to introducing chemicals into the brain, we can do the same thing through changing people's experience and, um, and providing more healthy, adaptive, um, coping skills for them. And so um, when we look back at that analogy again of the road, we know that the brain is able to change itself, but we also know that the brain change that does occur does not happen instant instantaneously. Or we would see spontaneous remission uh, much more often in the treatment range. Unfortunately, we don't because what happens is just like the tolerance and the dependency uh, took time to evolve and it took time for the brain to to change its physical structures. It's going to require the same thing when we are using uh, experience and ho experiential and holistic therapies to try to help people in recovery. And so using the analogy of the road, really what we're trying to do is um, provide alternatives different routes, detours, you could say, to the paths that the brain has become accustomed to using. So in this reward circuitry, um, again, as, as neuroplasticity takes time to develop, the atrophy that, that needs to occur um, in response to not introducing drugs and alcohol into the system is going to take time. It's going to take a long time. And so instead of sitting by and teaching people how to uh, get through that time and, and just wait until that brain circuitry um, reduces its influence or its tendency to want to be used. We can teach people healthy ways of improving their dopamine threshold by creating detours to that pathway. And that's where experiential and holistic therapies really come in, is that new experience can interrupt the old patterns in our neuropsychological pathways or our neuropsychological firings. So when we have an experience or an encounter that we make a choice or we become aware of our ability to choose through the identification of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors through an understanding of them and an ability to sit with them, to sit with that pain, um, and then make a choice towards um, healthy functioning, healthy brain functioning, that's really where we start to look at those new pathways being developed. Um, and so I really think that in the, the treatment arena that that needs to be our focus is how do we develop those new healthy pathways and then support um, those uh, through repeated practice, through experience, through the formation of habits in order to give our patients the best chance at recovery. So the other way that experiential therapy helps change the brain is that we talked before about how uh, the use of that pathway really creates a compulsion. And if we worked even for a brief period of time, we're very aware with the compulsion that comes with repeated drug use and addiction. And so the breakdown of that compulsion is the roadblock that we really want to create with our patients in making a choice for a more healthy, positive coping skill.
And so it also leads to uh, experiential therapy also changes the brain by leading to a greater understanding of the ability to control the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and by becoming aware of them. Because again, as we talked earlier about the, the necessity of brain integration, instead of just focusing on the reward circuitry and being compelled to uh, excite that pleasure principle, that reward circuitry, we then can take a step back and use the whole brain and whole brain integration in order to have more control over those circumstances and break up the compulsion. Um, so if we look at that being the way that experiential therapies help uh, with this concept of neuroplasticity, then we can look at holistic therapies and how, how those help change the brain. So really the holistic interventions, the majority of the time, um, help us to promote sustained dopamine release. So things like exercise, as we had talked about, help us kind of patch holes in those buckets where, where patients have used unhealthy coping skills and have used that reward circuitry and, and dopamine receptors have been eliminated by the brain and dopamine has not been produced as efficiently as it could be. Things like exercise help restore that sustained dopamine release which really gives our patients a better chance, a uh, better fighting chance at lasting recovery. So they leave our treatment centers and they still have those holes in the bucket and um, they still have low dopamine threshold, then they're really gonna have an added struggle at using any coping skills that we're trying to teach them. But if we can support that uh, healthy dopamine functioning while they're in treatment, then we give them a better chance when they leave. So if we can look at the uh, last slide, um, I want to kind of talk a little bit more now about how do we, what is the public perception of this type of um, intervention or this type of treatment, and how do we effectively communicate to payers and to the community what we're doing and how it works? Because I think right now in this time, um, in our industry, we're, we're kind of fighting an uphill battle with the use of experiential and holistic therapies. And for a couple of reasons, one is public perception and um, the other is payer perception. And so when we look at uh, public perception, at least at my experience, that the public tends to see these therapies, these modalities as fluff. They tend to see them as non-effective. They tend to see them as flashy. Um, and, and I really think that um, experiential and holistic therapies were hijacked by popular culture and implemented in treatment settings in, in a way that is, uh, was not beneficial to, to us or some of the patients that, that we were serving, that they um, were de being done or even sometimes still are being done by personnel that are not qualified or not trained to be using these um, techniques that they're not being um, done as neuroscientifically designed. It's more of um, a, an activity than it is an experiential process or, or a therapeutic intervention. Um, and so I think that in some ways, the public perception is that the use of these is, is fluff or it's filler or is ineffective. And so I think we have a bit of an uphill battle, but I think but I think that we have an advantage in changing that per public perception because we have neuroscience evidence on our side. We just need to effectively change the perception by communicating that scientific evidence that we just talked about. And then the other um, sort of battle that I think that we face in using these therapeutic modalities is, is payers. But insurance companies oftentimes um, see these therapeutic modalities that tend to be experiential or humanistic in nature as unscientific. I think that there has been a much larger push for other therapeutic modalities like cognitive behavioral therapy that have more measurable qualities that can be um, studied more, fit, more efficiently or easily um, in this kind of setting with symptom presentation and, and intensity rating scales. Um, and so the, the experiential therapies don't lend themselves to, 
to that type of measurement as easily. But I think that with the understanding that we now have of the brain and how the brain changes and how the brain changes through experience, that we can we can link those two and start to talk to um, some of those um, those researchers about what is working in the treatment space and and try to bridge that gap sometimes that happens between the scientific literature and what is clinically happening in in our practices that we know anecdotally to be effective um, and so i think that we then as practitioners become responsible for changing the reception the perception of the payer and the public and i think that we can do that in a variety of ways um, one i think in our in our literature and our advertising and our marketing that we can responsibly communicate the scientific basis for these interventions we need to do that on the websites and our literature and our communication referral sources and networking we need to really be able to talk about um, what is the evidence that supports the use of these instead of um, trying to look more flashy than the person next to us by having a cooler sounding activity um, and really get into what is the science behind the use of some of these things. I think the other way that we can change uh, the perception of the public and the payers is by measuring and tracking our outcomes. I think sometimes there's, there's a disparity between scientist and practitioner and um, and sometimes it, it's kind of hard to fill that gap between what researchers are saying is effective and what practitioners are saying is effective. But I think the one way that we as practitioners can really bridge that gap and be scientist practitioners is by measuring and tracking the outcomes, by proving to payers and the public that what we're doing is actually working. And so one way that we are doing that at First Steps is um, we have some pretty robust um, outcomes tracking measures in place that people receive at the time of mission and then throughout their stay and ongoing after discharge. I think one thing that we need to do is we look at these holistic and experiential therapies not lending themselves as well to um, measurement is we need to go beyond traditional measures of effectiveness. We need to move away from things that just measure symptom presentation or symptom intensity. We need to move away from days in sobriety or successful completion of a program. I think that those things are all important variables to be considered in the measurement of outcomes or the effectiveness of the treatment that we're delivering. But we need to incorporate more because we know that what we're doing is more. And so at First Steps, we have some traditional um, symptom-based measures that are, that are involved in our outcomes tracking. Um, things like depression and anxiety and mood disorders and things like that. But we've also introduced some wellness-based measures. And I think those wellness-based measures lend themselves more favorably to the experiential and the holistic therapies to be able to prove not just are we reducing symptoms, but we're, we're improving positive qualities of life, like work satisfaction, relational satisfaction, ability to cope with stressors, sleep those kinds of things that are more wellness-based often get left out when we're just talking about pathology-based measures. So I think that that's one way that we can um, contribute to this conversation and change the perception, especially of payers, because then we can have scientific evidence, we can have data that we can take to payers, to referral sources, in order to um, educate them on what is effective in the treatment arena instead of allowing other people outside of the treatment arena to dictate for us what works in more of a controlled setting. Because we all know we do not work in controlled settings. <laughs> um, I think the other thing that we can do with the, the data that we get from measuring and tracking outcomes is providing public education and continuing education on what works, right? We as practitioners need to stand up and say, we are now measuring and tracking the effectiveness of our interventions, and here is what we're seeing is working in our, in our area. Um, and then the next point is intentional scientific design. So I think that this kind of goes back to um, us being able to 
really design programs that have the neuroscientific evidence that we just discussed at the forefront of our interventions. That we can't look um, at things that look good on paper for marketing or outreach. We can't um, just put things into our programs that make people feel good. We have to put things into our program and intentionally design our programs around the neuroscientific evidence um, while incorporating anecdotally what we know to work in these holistic and experiential therapies. So I think that there can be a, a marriage of those, but we have to do our due diligence on the practitioner side to be very intentional about the scientific design and not just throwing a outing onto a support staff because it it's going to make the patients feel good, but being intentional about how that intervention is going to work. And so that kind of leads me to the next point is using qualified staff. So qualified staff, in my opinion, um, that are doing these holistic and experiential therapies are those that have the training, the education, and the supervision to do that, um, that are familiar with experiential interventions, um, and, and they don't have to be all of them. They can come from a specific therapeutic background, like Stahl therapy. They can uh, be the incorporation of a recreational therapist. And so I think that that's one other thing that is going to help us change this public perception is using qualified staff that has the credentials, the understanding of how to use these techniques intentionally, um, again, instead of just as filler. And so I, I think that um, using the neuroscientific uh, understanding that we have of how the brain changes in the, the addictive process, uh, the brain regions that get hijacked and reinforced through the the continued and habitual use, the compulsion, the tolerance that develops, um, and understanding how we can use experiential and holistic therapies to really be a brain-based, neuroscientific approach to changing the brain and using neuroplasticity in our favor, uh, you know, that we can change that perception for the if the public has, that payers have, so that we can prove to other people that, that these interventions that we know to work actually do work and then measuring and, and proving that through the accumulation of data and the dissemination of information that, that these interventions really are beneficial. So Tom, I don't know if you have questions at this point that you wanna open up to or begin with. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Tatum. That was uh, really great stuff. But before we get into the Q&A portion of the event, we would like to hand things over to Christy Crisman from Foundations for a few words from our sponsors. Thank you, Tom. Join us in Nashville August 9 and 10 for Innovations in Behavioral Health Care, Foundations event's premier conference designed to help you create long-term, sustainable health for your business and patients. With up to 13 hours of available CE credits, panels, and presentations from the industry's leading experts and thought leaders, as well as opportunities to network with referral sources, IIBH is a powerful investment toward the health of your organization, career, and patients. This year's keynote speakers include Miles Adcox of OnSite and Becca Stevens of Thistle Farms, and our varied lineup of breakout sessions, including Matthew, covers topics for providers in all areas of the behavioral health care field. Learn more and reserve your spot by visiting foundationsevents.com, and don't forget to use the promo code IIBHWebinar50 when registering. A gift from Foundations Events to you for $50 off. Thank you, and back to you, Tom. All right, thanks a lot, Christy. We've, uh, we've had a lot of questions coming in already from the audience. However, we would also like to remind you that you can use the Q&A area below the slides to submit a question at any time. Also, to download a copy of the slides, please click the Resources tab to the right of the presentation window. Let's get into some questions. All right, first question up. Do you provide modified exercise programs uh, for elderly or disabled persons who may not be able to be as physically active and uh, what other modifications might you make uh, for elderly people or other special populations? Um, I love that question because oftentimes what we see is that people um, 
have some resistance to being involved in in educational programs or sorry uh, exercise programs because of any modifications that they might need um, I, you know I think most of us probably have had the experience of walking into a gym and looking at the array of machines and wondering I uh, where do I start what do I do I don't know how that thing works and I think when we look at special populations whether it's people with um, physical disabilities or people with physical limitations, whether that be because of age or just the people with lack of an exposure to to exercise. I think we really need to be more attentive to those barriers that they might experience. But I also think that we need to not allow those to be um, to be uh, roadblocks that maybe it's a hurdle to overcome, but especially in exercise, there are a wide variety of things that, that people with any number of limitations can engage in to still improve that dopamine threshold. When I was doing integrated behavioral health, I was at a conference and uh, we all participated in chair activities for people that were wheelchair bound. And we all were getting our heart rate up and we were sweating and we were going and and everybody was participating and and so I think that we just need to be intentional there with our design of um, what what skills can be used you know does somebody need to um, be in a pool and do things like water aerobics do they need to do chair activities if they're wheelchair bound or if they have some sort of um, difficulty using their legs and so I think that again we can if we do the added work we can still use these same types of interventions with people that have those physical limitations. All right, uh, next question we have from the audience. Do behavioral addictions affect the brain similarly and might the same therapies be effective uh, for treatment of behavioral addictions? Yes, similarly, um, although we are gonna look at the the difference in introduction of chemicals into the brain, and we're going to look more at that reward pathway and the nucleus accumbens um, producing its dopamine uh, in response to some of those behavioral addictions, whether that is um, pornography or um, eating disorders, you know, any of those types of things are going to use the same reward circuitry in the brain. Um, and that reward circuitry is going to be reinforced and rewarded in the same kind of way to to lay down those those greater pathways that we talked about that are going to be uh, similarly resistant to change but the experiential therapies um, can have just as great of an impact with with some of those um, those process addictions um, I think in some ways they they can even have a greater advantage because some of those process addictions have a very significant behavior on emotional component, not just the introduction of chemicals. Um, and so I think we can absolutely use them in that, that same way. All right, um, how do you recommend incorporating uh, the topics you discussed today into an outpatient setting? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we can incorporate them in a very similar way. I think um, some of the, uh, things that we were talking about in terms of um, systematically or programmatically influencing the nutrition choices that somebody makes. You can't do it in an outpatient setting, but you can still hold nutrition classes and you can still talk to patients about how their nutrition impacts their neurological functioning. Um, you can still offer things like massage therapy. You can still offer things like yoga. Um, and from the experiential side, um, a, a similar thing that, that those experiential groups can still be done in an outpatient setting. Um, you know, th it may need to be adapted a little bit differently um, depending on the limitations of the facility, um, but I think that it, it can still be done. You know, in our, um, and sometimes, you know, you have to sort of navigate some of those. Um, payer guidelines in situations like that. And so you may be looking at um, things that are not reimbursable services. And so if you're doing experiential things like um, outdoor activities that you're leaving the, the outpatient facility, maybe you're doing that as part of um, 
you're programming that that isn't a billable service, but you know that you're providing healthy neurological functioning for your patients, which is going to increase their engagement in the outpatient program and sustain their success and recovery. Okay. Um, can medication-assisted treatment um, work in conjunction uh, with the experiential therapies that you were discussing today? Um, that is a good question. Um, when we look at the way that medication-assisted therapies sort of influence the brain, um, we, we're going to have a little bit more of a difficult time in using experiential therapies to change the neural circuitry in the brain when somebody is engaged in medication-assisted therapy. And the reason is because they're still getting, you know, we talked to, about that pathway and how that pathway um, continues to be reinforced over time. And, and when we're introducing medication that is mimicking those, those effects neurologically, um, we're going to have a little bit more of an uphill battle in changing, uh, in creating some of those roadblocks and, and changing the neural circuitry because we still have some of those reward pathways firing and functioning when the medication-assisted therapy is being used. Okay. Um, one of the things you had mentioned um, during your presentation um, was uh, the importance of food and nutrition and uh, just kind of the, some of the work that you were doing in terms of uh, meal preparation with clients and you know, some of those bad foods to avoid, like ice cream, candy, and, and soda and the like. Um, are there good foods that you would specifically – uh, recommend keying on, or is it basically just uh, you know everything that we would just generally consider to be uh, healthy foods also works here? Yeah, I think um, we come from a perspective of balance, um, so we don't subscribe to any one uh, specific philosophy or, or diet program. Um, we we look more to provide balance in meal preparation and meal planning um, and knowing that, that those sugars often uh, the introduction of them alone throws that balance out of proportion. Um, and so, you know, especially when we look at addiction and, and um, people that have that tendency to, to seek uh, gratification of that pleasure principle, that reward pathway in the brain, um, that, that sugars are going to um, have an impact there. And, and again, they're not going to be sustainable ways of improving dopamine functioning. Um, and not that they're all bad. It's just not going to be the healthiest choice that we can make to support uh, brain functioning. And so I think being able to provide that, what, that, that whole balance when it comes to diet is, is the most important aspect. Okay. Um, can you share a specific example of the types of thoughts or feelings that might come to the surface through experiential therapy that might not be able to be accessed through talk therapy? Sure. Um, I think that um, a, a person that might be pretty familiar to a lot of listeners is the early 20-something-year-old who is – fairly um, resistant or defensive that might not have a lot of internal motivation and probably brings a substantial amount of external motivation um, into treatment and is a bit resistant to change or a bit defensive, um, maybe even at times um, argumentative or, or, you know, we're not quite talking about um, the antisocial individual, but, but the person that we're just not convinced is, is quite ready um, to, uh, to look at the, the personal responsibility that's involved in their life choices and, and where they are and, um, and bring some defensiveness to group about that aspect of, of personal responsibility. I think getting somebody like that involved or engaged in an activity, um, the engagement in that activity in and of itself is going to bring down the defenses, is going to take the person from off of the couch, crossing their arms with their hoodie on, and, and engage them in an activity. And when you can find an activity that 
may be of interest to them, whether they're at least willing to give a try, that that, that will start to bring down the defenses and they can start to look at um, some of their thought patterns. One example is we were, uh, I was engaged in an experiential exercise with a young man of a similar uh, presentation and he was like, man, I would really love to have a beer when doing this. And then he stopped and he said, oh, shoot, I'm not supposed to say that. And so it gave me the opportunity to look at that thought with him, one that he had the urge of the craving to use in a similar situation, a serious, similar experience. Um, and then and then to be able to kind of process that and understand that. Where is that thought coming from? How is that thought um, influenced your behavioral choices in the past? How can we look at um, other ways of relating to that thought. You don't have to get rid of that thought, but do you have to act on that thought? Um, and so it really gave us the opportunity to to kind of process and to work through that thought that popped up in his head. But it also gave us the opportunity to to really understand um, his his next thought was that oh, if I'm in recovery, I can't have that thought. I shouldn't be thinking that in these situations. Um, and so it was it was able to lead us to a greater understanding of some of his thought patterns um, that happen in, in similar experiential situations. All right, well, I think that's going to be just about all the time we have for questions today. Uh, we do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. Uh, do not leave this page. Please continue to stay on the platform. The site will automatically redirect you to a survey, and the survey must be completed in order to generate your CE certificate. For those watching in the group, as a reminder, please download the group submission guide in the resources tab to the right of the slides and follow the instructions provided. Please note CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for the live event here today on July 31st, 2018. And if you enjoyed today's program, please join us on August 28th at 1 p.m. for a presentation with Courtney Grimes on the current challenges of college women that impact behavioral health. A link to register can be found in the resources tab to the right of the video window. I want to thank Dr. Matthew Tatum once again for an excellent presentation. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Foundations Recovery Network for making today's program possible. And finally, a thank you to you and our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us again in the future for another IABHC webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Have a great day.